My friend Jim was a great basketball player in high school. Uh, during one particular weekend, he scored 51 points. He scored 25 points on a Friday night game, and then he scored 26 at a Saturday game. It ended up um, being enough to lead the league in scoring for that particular weekend. Jim went home feeling really excited about how he had played. And he came into the living room of his home and he saw that his dad was seated on the couch in deep thought. This was the first time seeing his dad since the game. Uh, Jim's dad didn't spring to his feet, give him a high five. He didn't hug Jim, didn't say great game. Uh, Jim's dad simply asked the question, do you know that you missed four free throws? And Jim said, yes, yeah, I, I know that. Jim's dad then asked, do you know why you missed those shots? Jim said, no. Jim's dad said, your feet were in the wrong position. Uh, Jim felt just stunned. He, he was deeply hurt. He wondered, you know, I, I played my heart out. I did my best. What else could I have done to make my dad proud of me, to to win his affirmation and approval. Anthropologists, psychologists, and theologians have long told us that one of the deepest hungers that we humans have is the hunger to be blessed, affirmed, and loved by a father, a mother, or some significant person in our life. If we fail to receive that blessing, affirmation, approval, from a father, a mother, or someone important in our life, we will have this real void. But if we are blessed, approved of, praised, loved by someone important in our life, we will have a stronger sense of identity. We'll have less of a feeling that we're not good enough. We'll have less shame. If we feel blessed and loved by someone, we will literally have a stronger immune system. And according to Dr. Sue Johnson, the late Dr. Sue Johnson, the respected psychologist and family expert based out of Victoria, BC, the author of the best-selling books, Hold Me Tight and Love Sense, if we feel blessed and loved, we will grow and expand. As we continue our series in the book of Ephesians, today we're going to be looking at how Paul prays that we would experience blessing, affirmation, and love from the greatest being in the universe. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, prays this prayer. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now, it's noteworthy that Paul kneels to pray, because in his day, a typical Jewish person would stand to pray. The fact that Paul is kneeling to pray suggests that he is taking a posture of real humility before God, and that he is praying fervently from the bottom of his heart. So Paul prays, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. A living God, we heard that Paul prays this prayer, not just for the church at Ephesus, but for all of God's holy people across all time. And so we pray that 
his prayer would be answered in our lives, that we would somehow, some way, grasp the mystery and the wonder and the gift of your love for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It's noteworthy that in this prayer, which is considered by many to be Paul's greatest prayer ever recorded in Scripture, that Paul doesn't pray that the people who will first hear this letter read, the church at Ephesus and and those in churches or in faith communities in the Roman Empire of the first century, it's significant that he doesn't pray that they would experience physical health. It's noteworthy because they are living in a world where poverty, malnutrition, and infectious diseases are really widespread, and where infant mortality is staggeringly high. If a person were able to survive the first weeks or first months of their life, become a child, If they were typical, they could only expect to live to 20-something or 30-something years of age. And so it's, it's significant that Paul doesn't pray for the physical health of the church at Ephesus, or for, for ours, for that matter. It's also noteworthy that Paul, who is writing this letter from a prison cell in Rome, doesn't pray that the Ephesians... Or, or, or we would be freed from persecution, the kind of persecution that would land us in prison. Now, our physical health and our freedom from persecution and our not being in prison are important. But when Paul prays for the church and prays for us, his first prayer is that we would experience and know Christ's love because he deems that to be our greatest need. In verse 16, Paul prays, out of God's glorious riches, may he strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, as Paul pens these words, he's writing to people at the church of Ephesus, Ephesus, who for the most part are already following Christ. So, In this prayer, he doesn't mean that the people at Ephesus would experience and encounter Christ for the first time when he says, I pray that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. The word dwell can be translated, make a permanent home in or settle down in. Paul's praying for the people of Ephesus and for us that Christ would make a home in our hearts, that he would dwell richly there so that we might deeply experience God's love. Paul goes on to pray in verses 17 and 18, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is God's love for you in Christ. The brilliant 18th century theologian Jonathan Edwards observed that it's possible to have a kind of theoretical head knowledge of honey. I'm holding some honey in my hand, some wildflower honey from the honey shop not far from here. It's possible to know what honey looks like. It's it's golden hue. It's possible to know the chemical properties of honey. It's possible to hear descriptions of what honey tastes like, but in order to truly know the sweetness of honey, you have to actually taste it. By chance, is anyone here in the mood for some honey now or later this week? Okay, I see a lot of hands, some hands raised, so you want to just pass this back your way? I don't want to throw it because uh, even though Paul didn't pray for your physical health, he he, he would have wanted it. So uh, there you go. Enjoy, savor. What was the point here? In order to truly know the sweetness of honey, you need to taste it firsthand. You can have it an hour later. It's up to you. So uh, we're an open community. Uh, And in order to truly know the love of God, we need to have more than a theoretical head knowledge of it. We need to do more than just hear descriptions of it. In order to truly know the love of God, we need to experience God's love firsthand. And this is why the psalmist 
says in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Now, for some people, on rare occasions, they experience a kind of out of the blue experience of God's love. As I've shared with some of you, during what I think was the darkest, lowest time of my life, I remember being in an apartment where I was living at the time, and it was actually dark in the apartment, small little place, actually a suite of a, of a home. And I was not praying, but suddenly I sensed the presence of God come into the room with such a sweetness, with such love that I was just overcome by it. And part of the reason I believe in God to this day is because of that experience. Blaise Pascal, the 17th century physicist, mathematician, and philosopher, as a young man, was home alone. The sun was setting. It was getting dark outside. And out of the blue, he experiences this profound sense of God's holy presence. He grabs a pen and he writes the word fire. Fire, one word. And then he writes, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned. And Pascal was a philosopher and of the learned. He wrote, God of Jesus Christ, joy, 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 tears of joy. And tears were streaming down his cheek. He took that paper that he'd written these words on and he actually sewed it into the inner liner of his coat. Apparently he never washed his coat again. It was more important for him to remember what happened. And this was in a time in the 17th century before dry cleaning technology was available. So I think I can say that pretty confidently. In the 14th century, there was a woman named Julian of Norwich who was literally on her deathbed. She was dying. And she has this out of the blue vision of Jesus speaking to her from the cross. And she's healed. She goes on to live. And through that vision and some other visions, Julian of Norwich receives a revelation of God's love, compassion, and mercy. So for some people, and it's quite rare, they experience this out of the blue, mystical sense of God's love for them. But we don't have to wait for that mystical experience. We can engage in spiritual practices that can make us more receptive to an everyday sense that we are loved by our creator. This is important because if we have experienced affirmation, approval, and praise in our life, it's almost certainly because we did something good or did something well. Uh, as a student, we did really well on an exam and so we were praised. Or we did great in a sporting event like Jim did. In his case, he wasn't praised by his father, but we did well and, and maybe we were praised. Or we, we really rocked it as we performed musically. Or, or, or we did something great at work and, and, and we were affirmed or, or promoted. And because all of our life, if we have been praised, we've been praised and affirmed because we have done something good or we have been good, we have come to believe at a conscious or unconscious level that love is always dependent on how we perform, on what we do, or on how good we are. And so it's hard for us to believe that a being could love us with a perfect love that is without condition. This is why these spiritual practices that open us to God's love more fully are really important and life-giving. In my most recent book, Now I Become Myself, How Deep Grace Heals Our Shame and Restores Our True Self, I cite a psychiatrist friend of mine who points out that it only takes two or three seconds for shame to form in our brain, but it takes 60 or 90 seconds for affirmation to form in our brain. And so we need to sit and savor affirmation and love. Similarly, the novelist Chuck Polinick has said, it's so hard to forget pain, 
but it's even harder to remember sweetness. It's so hard to forget pain, but it's even harder to remember sweetness. And so we need to sit with sweetness, the sweetness of God's love, ponder it, meditate on it, taste it, savor it. And one of the ways we can do that is through the spiritual practice of silence. I've shared with some of you that each morning I I seek to have a time of silence. And at the end of that time of silence, I will imagine God the Father saying over me the words he spoke over Jesus at his baptism. I'll take a deep breath, exhale, and say, Ken, as though God were speaking, you are my beloved son, in you I delight. Take a deep breath, exhale, repeat. Ken, you are my beloved son, in whom I delight. Take a deep breath, exhale. Ken, you are my beloved son, in you I delight. I like to begin my day with a sense of being loved by God and being reminded. And if your life is in Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, you are, according to Ephesians, in Christ. And all the love and all the affection and all the cherishing that God has for his unique son, Jesus, he also has for you. So it's perfectly appropriate to pray that affirmation. Or to foster a deepening sense of God's love for you, you might pick a a verse in scripture that you find especially meaningful to you or moving. I have a friend who loves God's words in Zephaniah 3.17, where the prophet, speaking for God, says, I will take great delight in you, and I will rejoice over you with singing. And so she imagines God taking delight in her and rejoicing over her with singing. And it it moves her into a place where she feels more loved by God. Or you could take the verse that we're looking at today, where Paul prays that we would be rooted and established in love and together with all the Lord's holy people, know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is God's love for us in Christ Jesus. Jesus. We might even memorize it. It's, it's a fairly simple and um, you know, short, short passage. But we could ponder how wide God's love is for us. You know, God's love is wide. It spans the whole world. For God so loved the world, we read in a famous verse. In Revelation, we read God saying, whosoever will may come. It's wide but it's also wide enough to include you. You know, Billy Graham, the late great evangelist, has said, if you were the only person on earth, God in Christ would have still died for you. God's love is wide. God's love is also long. As we discussed in one of the earlier opening sermons in this series, if you are located in Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, God saw you long, long ago. He saw you in his mind's eye before he laid the foundation of the earth. He loved you and he chose you. God's love is long. It it has extended across your whole life thus far through all the vicissitudes, through all the ups and downs. God's love has been there. God's love is wide. It is long. It is also high. No matter how high you go, no matter how exalted successful, triumphant, glorious, your life, your existence becomes, God's love is higher yet. And scripture tells us that Jesus prayed to share his glory with us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Amazing. Scripture also tells us that if our lives are in God's hands, one day we will shine like the stars forever and ever. No matter how high we go, God's love is higher yet. God's love is high. It's also deep, Paul writes. Paul prays. No matter how low we go, as Matt Mayer's song, Christ is Lower Still, expresses, Christ's love is lower than our lowest low. It's beneath us. It's above us. Tyler Statton is a pastor that I've gotten to know over the last year or two, someone who I greatly respect and admire. Tyler makes the observation that 
The greatest sign that the Holy Spirit is truly at work in your life is not that you are able to speak a foreign language without ever having studied it. The greatest sign that God is at work within you is not that you can work miracles or predict the future. The greatest sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life is that you can go through deep pain, disappointment, regret, deep lows, and yet are assured that you are loved by God. That's the greatest sign, according to Tyler, and I think he's right. So we can meditate on how wide, long, high, and deep is God's love for us, in silence or or with words, to awaken more fully to God's love. And then we can seek to refocus. Many of you would probably know the name Dr. Gabor Mate, a Vancouver-based physician who practiced for many years on the downtown east side. He's also a prolific and gifted author. Dr. Mate was once asked by a very successful dynamic CEO, chief executive officer, uh, and the, the, the CEO admitted, I struggle with feelings of not being good enough, of, of shame. How do, I, how do I get out of that space? And Dr. Mate spontaneously responded by saying, seek to refocus. You might literally take a walk. It doesn't have to be a long walk, but just move your body, take a walk. It's ideal if it's in nature, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. You could, you could bring to mind a memory of a time you were loved to get out of that dark space. Every week on my Sabbath, if I can, I take a long walk and I recount God's gifts in my life thus far. And sometimes I will recall being, I think I was three or four or five years old. I can't remember exactly what age. I was living in England. I could not swim. And my dad took me in his arms and he walked me into the deep end of the pool, at least deep for me at that time as a person, as a little kid who couldn't swim. And I remember feeling scared and I remember feeling safe. And I remember feeling afraid, and I remember feeling loved. And sometimes a memory of being loved by someone can open a window into how we are loved by God. A few weeks ago, I quoted Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, the author of the brilliant book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I explained how Dr. van der Kolk, as he was engaged in his clinical work with his patients and diving into a a vast sea of medical literature, began asking the question, what causes a person who has experienced severe trauma in their childhood to turn a corner and move toward wholeness? And what causes a person who has experienced severe trauma in childhood to stay stuck with feelings of suicide and self-destruction? And through his research, through his observations, Dr. Van der Kolk came to this conclusion. If a person who's been severely traumatized in their childhood has a memory long ago of feeling safe with someone, that memory of feeling safe can be reactivated and that person can move toward wholeness. But if a person has no memory ever of ever being safe with someone, of ever being loved by anyone, it's very difficult for them to turn that corner and move toward wholeness. It's a very steep hill to climb. Now, if you're here and you have no memory of ever being loved or safe with anyone, if you have put your life in the hands of Jesus or if you are doing that even right now as I speak, you can know that Before the foundation of the earth was laid, God had his eye on you, that he loved you, that he chose you, that you're his. And as you know that or recall that, that can open the door for your path toward wholeness. And so we can experience more fully God's love as we meditate on it in silence, as we seek to refocus. And we can also experience more fully the sweetness of God's love as we walk a pathway literally of beauty. I've shared with some of you, I've written about an experiment done at Stanford University that showed that if a person walks long enough in a place of natural beauty, the part of their brain associated with feeling anxiety, self-criticism, and depression actually goes quiet. It goes offline, so to speak. 
that part of us in a place of beauty that says, you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not loved, goes quiet. So walking in a path of beauty, in a place of wonder, can prepare us to receive more fully God's love for us. It's part of my own rhythm of life. Uh, I like to walk every day if I can through a favorite street in our neighborhood. I, I've seen some of you there. Uh, once a week if I can, I, on my Sabbath day, I like to walk, if I can, along the beach with our Golden Retriever Sasha or through a forest trail. It's part of my rhythm of life. I literally want to put myself in a pathway of beauty. And perhaps you can too, especially if you live in Vancouver. Lots of beauty here. And as you walk along a favorite street in your neighborhood or the beach or forest, or as you view beautiful art, or as you listen to gorgeous music and you allow yourself to feel a sense of wonder and awe and wow, you get a window into how God feels when God sees you. Because when God sees you, God feels wonder and awe and wow, wow. Yeah, just like you do when you look into your baby's face, God feels that and more. As some of you know, in my most recent book, Now I Become Myself, How Deep Grace Heals Our Shame and Restores Our True Self, at the end of each chapter are prayer exercises that can help us awaken more fully and more consciously to the fact that we are loved by God. We have some copies available afterwards in the Upper East Hall. 100% of all the proceeds go to World Vision, missions that work with vulnerable children, including our mission partners here at 10th. Uh, but if you cannot afford the, the discounted $10 price, I'm happy to gift you with a copy. I've set aside some of my own money to do that. Uh, I'd be honored. Just uh, go to the Upper East Hall and say, this one's on Ken. You don't even need to say my last name. Just say, this one's on Ken. I'd be honored to gift it to you. I know my heart, last name is way too hard to say anyway. As we look at the last verse of Paul's prayer, he prays that we would grasp this love that surpasses human knowledge so that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Experiencing God's love isn't just about having a stronger sense of identity, though that will happen. It's not just about having a stronger physical immune system. It's not just about expanding and growing, though those are great. God's love is ultimately about something, an experience that so fills us to the measure of God that we can't help but spill over with that love for others so that we become a channel of God's love in the world. And this could be a whole different sermon, obviously. Maybe Pablo can preach on it sometime. As we say it here at 10th, with God for others, with God, not just for ourselves, but with God for others. And so it is not just a privilege, but it is a calling, a kind of sacred responsibility to live love so that we are filled to the measure of the fullness of God and have more love to offer the world. I began this message by describing how my friend Jim in high school had played these amazing set, two, uh, a set of two basketball games, scoring 51 points, leading the league that particular weekend. And he came home and his dad didn't acknowledge at all what he had accomplished. And he described this experience later with a mutual friend of ours named Michael. And Michael responded by saying, wow, I guess you were, I guess you were hoping for a different response, man. Uh, that must have really hurt. And Jim said, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, it did hurt. I, I was hoping my dad would say something like, great game. 51 points, that was amazing. It was, it was painful. And then his friend paused and said, I find, it, I find it interesting, really interesting, that your dad talked about the position of your feet. Jim said, well, why, why, why is that interesting to you? His friend said, well, it shows me that your dad was there in the stands and from the stands, he really, really wanted to help you, but he realized he couldn't help you. And the only way he could help you was by noticing that the stance of your feet were off. And that's why he asked you about, do you know why you missed those free throws? 
He wanted to help you from the stands. And the only way he knew how to was by correcting you on the stands of your feet. His friend said, now, that's not what you needed to hear. That's not what your dad should have told you. Your dad should have said something like, great game. You played amazing. Let's have dinner together. And then and only then, sometime after, he should have said, could we work on your free throws? I, I did notice something about your feet, but that doesn't happen, need to happen now. And, and Jim literally started weeping and he said, oh, my dad really does care for me. My dad really does love me. And he's in tears and he's saying, my dad's just not very good at showing it. My dad's just clumsy at showing how much he cares for me. And I'm not very good at seeing that love either. Our perfect father in heaven has no problem demonstrating his perfect love for us. Scripture tells us in Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, while we were still distant from God, resisting God consciously or unconsciously, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. He became a human being, was given the name Jesus, lived a perfect life, voluntarily died on a Roman cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so they could be removed, so that we could enter into a deep experience of God's love for us. A love that's so wide, so high, so long, so deep, that it surpasses our human understanding. And yet when we begin to grasp that love, we are filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And we become an instrument of God's love in the world. Let's pray together. Remind yourself for a moment that you are in the presence of God right now. Maybe even take a deep breath. And remember that you are surrounded by God. And now I want you to hear God's words to you. They're not words from scripture. They're words written by a Dutch writer on the spiritual life named Henry Nouwen. But I really believe they express God's heart for you. So listen to them as God's word to you. God says, I love you, not because you do good things. I love you. Not because you have a lot of things. Not because people speak well about you. Not because you are so exciting or have so many talents. God says, I love you because I love you because I love you. And if you want, you can simply pray in your spirit, God, Help me to grasp, help me to experience that love you have for me. It's so wide and long and high and deep. And if you sense that something is blocking you from God's love, you can turn to God in prayer in your heart and say, God, forgive my sins. Remove anything that would keep me from you. Make me your daughter or son. Make me your child and God will. And continue to pray this prayer that you would be more and more awakened to God's love. That is our greatest need and privilege. And know that as you continue to seek to experience this love of God, that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to the power of his spirit at work within us. So may it be so. May it be so for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.